it's really it's really important to understand who your target customer is and where you can find them in the most effective way and then uh, and then that's that's what you do if it's performance marketing like like, like google ads or or meta ads in, in facebook or, or instagram um could could be that or it could be seo so you have to work for a few for a few months to uh, to create lots of content to attract people Welcome to the Entail AI Podcast, discussions with marketing executives sharing their latest techniques for growing their businesses online. Um, hey, hello everybody. Uh, today I have the pleasure of having here with me Oleg Levedev, um, CMO, uh, ex-Alibaba uh, and ex-Barclays, uh, with a lot of experience in, in uh, marketing for e-commerce and, and uh, finance. Uh, so happy to have you, Oleg. How are you doing today? It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm very good. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Um, so with, I'd like to speak to you today about, about uh, marketing strategies for 24 for uh, uh, FinTech. Uh, but before we start, maybe you can take a moment to introduce yourself a little bit to your background. Sure. Love to talk about myself, so no problem. Uh, so I've got uh, more than 15 years experience in marketing. I worked in both really big companies like uh, like Alibaba uh, and and Barclays, big global corporations, and and in the startups like like Trace Money, and um, I love working for startups because that's that's a lot of that's a lot of fun. So I've done quite a few marketing roles all, all the time, uh, and um, I uh, um, think that fine that in in fintech and in ecom. Uh, marketing is is really exciting, although although it can be quite quite different, and a few things are uh, are the same, such as the focus on brand and authenticity and and, and trust, uh, and secondly, it's the ability to attract traffic effectively and convert traffic into leads. So uh, those are the two key things that I think uh, well, I think unite ecom and uh, and fintech or financial services in general. Okay, and, and um, which which marketing channels are I mean are your default or your favorite? I mean, I mean, the CMO you've probably done quite a lot of, of everything, but I can say for myself, you know, there's often the types of marketing that I'm more attracted to. So, what is like your go-to uh, channel usually? I don't have that. Uh, I, I think uh, I think it all it all depends on on your on your target customers. So. Uh, it's really it's really important to understand who your target customer is and where you can find them in the most effective way, and then uh, and then that's that's what you do. If it's performance marketing like like, like Google Ads or or Meta Ads in, in Facebook or, or Instagram, um, could could be that, or it could be SEO. So you have to work for a few for a few months to uh, to create lots of content to attract people, or it could be offline. You know, offline also exists. You can you can go out. Uh, you know, you can you can leave uh, uh, you can leave Zoom and go outside on the street, and you can uh, you can gather your customers there. And actually, uh, for online businesses, going offline can be a very uh, very interesting and rewarding journey because nobody else is there; none of your competitors are there. So, uh, depends on the customer. Okay, I mean, I've, to be honest, I've never I've never done anything offline offline really um, as a, in marketing. I mean. Uh, that's an interesting approach. Never really thought about this. Um, and and in general, in in fintech, um, and I mean, is there any 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 real change or differences between fintech marketing and other industries like compared to to uh, e-commerce? Like which um, in terms of which channels work, or it, or it has to do with the specific business you're working on? Well, I think there's a, there's a quite a difference between b2c and, and b2b uh b2b fintech uh versus uh versus ecom so some of the tools are similar some of the tools are completely completely different but i think what is the key difference uh of any financial services marketing to any other marketing is um is really trust uh trust has to be the, t- the absolute top priority you see, it's been it's been proven uh, by uh, psychological uh, research that the way people choose uh, between, say, two products, they do not choose the better product. They choose the product which will perform well 
and where they have the least risk of losing everything or screwing up or getting tre- treated badly. So people are quite, actually quite risk averse. And in, uh, in financial marketing, that's, mul- that's multiplied t- tenfold. So that is really, really important, creating, creating trust. Okay, and, and that's true, I guess, both for B2B and B2C. I mean, it's pretty much the same challenge, right? But, but, but you use different measures to do that between B2C and B2B? I think it's, uh, I think it's created, uh, um, created a bit, a bit different. Uh, first of all, in B2B, uh, your sales force, because most B2B businesses have, have, uh, have a sales force, play a really huge part in, uh, in creating customer relationship and maintaining the customer relationship which is something that you do not have in the, in the B2C environment. So in B2C, it's basically, it's about your uh, UX. It's how, uh, how good your product is, how convenient it is, how quick it is, and, and the quality of your advertisement and the effectiveness of your, of your conversions. That's B2C. In B2B, uh, the human factor plays, um, and, uh, I feel, a much stronger role. So uh, it's very important to show business owners who are the clients of B two B that they're dealing with real people? Yes, there are technologies, there are tools, there are products, blah blah blah. It's, it's all very important, but it's important that the real people uh, would be great. There is a real office, uh, and people who go to the real office uh, and and you can see faces and you can see their names and what they do, um, and then their relationship with their salesperson is also uh, incredibly important because technologies fail, rules fail, processes fail, and this is where human interaction and human um, human support can really change everything for uh, for the client. And in terms of of, um, of marketing strategies that, that you're using now, I mean, I think it's very interesting always for marketers to hear about what people are doing now, because when you look at other businesses and, and trying to understand what they do in terms of marketing, like looking from the outside can often can feel even like almost like mysterious, you could say. Um, but maybe you can tell us a bit, like from your personal experience, uh, about like what strategies you're seeing and then what works for you now, you know, in 2024, in terms of social media or using UGC, video content, etc. cetera. Um, I think uh, uh, there's a few things uh, which are really important. So, one strategy uh, is, like I said, to generate trust. So, with your communication, You've got to you've got to show not only the advantages of your product, but your human side. Uh, you have to convince people that you're dealing with humans. And um, for example, founder stories are great because uh, founders, successful founders, they have normally experienced the pain which caused them to create the business and to create the product. So when when they tell their stories well and they tell it uh, over time. Many many times in different in different media in uh, and in social in social media throughout interviews, so that creates that creates a lot of trust that people really who work for this business and who are for the selling and trying to sell this product they really understand what they're talking about and they really feel the same pain. So this is really important. Uh, second thing, which I think is is very important for financial uh, financial services businesses in terms of creating trust, is make sure. Show people that you've got licenses to do business. Uh, you know, when I when I go on a on a on a website of electronic money institution, I don't look at the top first. I scroll all the way to the bottom, and I see where do they have licenses for what countries, for what jurisdictions, and if their license is from a country where financial controls are not great, you know, they might have the best website in the world. You know, I'm, you know, I'm just not going to deal with them. So, uh, so licensing is, is really is really really important, um, and uh, uh, so that's that's number one. Second, second thing which I find is going to be very important in uh, this year is as ever really, but in this year in particular is content. So, if you want to be uh, attracting, acquiring traffic uh, inexpensively, you've got to become a media company. You've got to create lots of content, and you've got to uh, I've, I've got to optimize it, uh, SEO optimize it. And to do that, now you do have tools, and that's uh, uh, and that's uh, AI AI uh, AI jam. So you've got to be able to use those tools to create 
lots of content in a very short period of time. Uh, I, back in the day, I don't know, 10 years ago, you had to wait a year and a half until your SEO efforts would pay off, right? So today you don't need to do that. Today it can happen within two, three, four months of you starting to produce a lot of content. So, so becoming a media, media company, uh, however strange and absurd it might sound, for financial services, for a B2B financial services company, can be very, very, very beneficial. So it's, uh, it's number two. You're basically preaching to the choir here because uh, I often tell people that <laughs> that um, they really need to be to become a, a, um, a media company. And I can give you an example. I mean, if you look uh, if you look at, at a fashion business, you know, like e-commerce that's selling selling clothes, basically, you know, and 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 let's say they have a line of I don't know selling clothes to women, and they have I know fifteen addresses every month, or you know, and they need to like renew their inventory all the time. And so, if they have fifteen addresses, they need to fit, they need to take photos of these dresses so they can have like new product pictures. They need to have models. They need to do videos and content for social media. So basically, they have their own media company in house, filming models with the new clothes like all the time. So they operate like a media company. You can't be a fashion company. You can't be an e commerce store selling clothes. That is a fashion company. We don't always think about it like that. But you can't be one if you don't have a media company in house. If you don't have the capability to to take photos like pr- professional photos of models, high quality, high scale, all the time to upload new photos, it can be that your style can be more not not necessarily necessarily have to be like like look like models. It can look like more like almost like user generated if that's your style. Okay, but still you have to produce a lot of content all the time. Their content is models, you know. We're in a different business. We're not doing content for, fa- for the fashion industry. We're not doing models. We, it's For us, it's more about expertise, experience, perspective, information, education, and so on. Um, but still, if, you're, if you want to play in, in the content game in 24, you need to be able to create a lot of content. Um, but one of the challenges that, that, that we see, uh, especially with AI now, is that it's become very, very inexpensive for companies to create content for that reason um companies need to increase the quality of their content because everyone now can create content everyone now can create cheap content with ai so if everyone can create cheap content with ai google doesn't want to index all the content that everyone creates because it's too much there's a hyperinflation of content and that's one trend that's really affecting what's going on on Google. Right now, I think that companies that are using a lot of AI in their content creation, they may see results now where I think what's going to happen pretty soon is that Google keeps on updating their algorithms to, to fight that. Not because, not because there's an issue with, creating, with using AI in your content creation process. It's more because of the hyperinflation of content. And, and having to be able to find the, the best content and not just any content. So that's one one trend. The other trend is video. Everybody is shifting to video. You know, the world has shifted to video. I mean, all of us now consume more video than, than, than text. It's true to almost everyone. And we do so more and more on social media than, than other channels. So what we say at Intel is we say, you know, companies need to be video first create first video content, then you can also turn it into text content, into articles, posts for social media that include the captions and text and so on. But it's first it's first about video. And I think that's very challenging for many companies. I mean, I'd like to hear your take about that. Like, uh, I mean, if you if you have any experience with that or um, the companies that you work with. Yeah, create, creating, creating videos that people would watch is a huge challenge. Um, I've, I've, done, I've done lots of uh, lots of ads um, in in my in my professional life. Uh, TV TV ads, YouTube ads, uh, TikTok ads, all kinds all kinds of ads. And I can tell you that whether you do this with um, AI, which might be might be cheap, although not, not of the same quality yet today, um, or you do this uh, you do this sort of manually or half manually. Uh, how do you come up with an interesting story? Uh, you know, because product uh, product videos, which shows how it goes 
sort of like, like this, like that, like that, 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 that. Nobody watches that. That you know, that that was 15 years ago, or I don't know, or 10 years ago. Um, if you don't tell people the story in five seconds, they're gone. So uh, it's a it's a it's a huge challenge, and uh, it's a huge challenge for for both B two C and B two B businesses. I think a bigger one B two B businesses because short videos uh, are yet to take hold of uh, uh, LinkedIn. You know, I don't see I don't see many short short videos uh, on LinkedIn, and um, for a B two B company, it's very scary to go into TikTok. It really, it really is because you know. Still, uh, finally enough, TikTok perceived as a platform for twelve-year-olds, which is completely untrue. Uh, and and I see all kinds of things being sold on TikTok, uh, including uh, uh, like private jets, etc. So subscribe to this guy who sells private jets. It's unbelievable, uh, and he does sell private jets on TikTok, so he gets lead from that. So it's um, it's it's a huge, huge challenge. Uh, I personally. Uh, uh, have not cracked it um, and uh, sort of uh, scaled it for uh, for B2, uh, as, as a B2B solution because it needs to be a great story. Occasionally we get, um, we come up with a, with a good good engaging video on, on LinkedIn, but it's, uh, it's not at scale yet. I mean, what, what do you think um, in terms of the difference between paid channels and organic channels? I mean, because it's related to that because, because, the world's attention is on social media and you know it doesn't matter like you like you're saying people on tiktok there's a person there selling private jets and i can believe that i mean interesting what that person is but i can tell you also in terms of, of b2b marketing i see a lot of b2b topics on tiktok that are getting a lot of views i mean these are topics about like how to manage your company hr related topics uh, um uh, um, driving change in organizations, etc., and, and these topics get a lot of views, and, and these are topics that are relevant to business executives, which means that they are there, that the audience is there. Like, like a child doesn't watch, or like young girls, twelve-year-old girl don't watch this type of content, right? You know, what the, you know what the challenge is. You know what the challenge. Sorry to interrupt. You know what the challenge is with this? Because uh, yes, there is content, but if you look at how many content makers that uh, that space are. There aren't that many. I mean, there are millions of businesses around the world. And can you imagine if each of them would have a content maker? So millions of content makers which would produce content of such great quality, just impossible, right? And the, the people who produce great content on uh, uh, on TikTok, they are mostly not, they're so good that they're not, they're not work for anybody. They work for themselves, right? And so for a normal business who's got lots of things going on, to find someone who does great TikTok videos for you is extremely rare. It does happen, but it's extremely it's extremely rare. It's a it's a huge challenge because you know because of the because of the type of the platform. But you can have ads on TikTok. Uh, so the, for the, as a, as a performance marketing tool, you can you can certainly use that. Absolutely. Okay, and and I mean it's true. I can tell. I mean. Both for B2C and B2B, it is quite challenging to find good creators that can work for you. And, and I think a lot, of, a lot of the challenge lies in the fact that if you're a good content creator and, and you already have followers and you're succeeding, you may want to work for yourself. You may not want to work for anyone else. Even though just a very small percentage of, of creators really do make a living out of it. But still, if you're very successful, you want to go on your own way. Um, it's difficult to hire people that will create content for you, and then, and then, besides that, another big challenge is that it's not just enough to be a content creator. You need to be an expert, especially in B two B, and in any type of content, any type of product that you sell that requires information or education. Um, in in fintech, it's probably it, this probably applies to all the products in fintech. You need information to create trust, to educate the audience, to to so they can feel comfortable and trusted to buy a product. Um, and then it's very difficult to find an expert that's also a good creator. And usually the the leaders in the company who have the the expertise, they don't have the time bandwidth to, to create content or it's going to be too expensive for, for them in terms of time. So that's I, I think this is a, a challenge for all, basically for all the businesses, right? 
Absolutely, that that is uh, that is that is right. That is very true. So, uh, but w- we've got to persevere. We can't we can't give up. We've got to look for people who can work with uh, with the um, with the founders, with the CEOs, with the product with the product owners, and and try to tell their story in a uh, in a fun and creative way. And uh, and there are you know there there are example examples of that. So uh, and we've got to work with uh, with with creators, with agencies, with freelancers, and try and try and try. But like you said, it's so important that you know the product. You so important that you understand the customer pain uh, and what the product does to solve it. And you've got to feel it in your, you know, in your bones to be able to do good, co- good content. Um, so for financial services, products are often quite complex. And it's not easy for, especially for a young person uh, without much much business experience, to quickly understand that and and, and tell and tell a, gr- a great story in a simple way. So, yeah. In terms of, of uh, like if if you're a company, if you want to build a new marketing strategy for for a fintech business, um, do you have a formula? Like, how do you go about it? What steps do you follow when when um, building a strategy? I don't think I'm going to say anything dramatically new. Uh, I think the most important thing is to find a big common customer pain, which has not been very well solved today. So, um, and the, the the most the most successful uh, stories that I've seen is that when founders uh, have actually experienced the pain themselves, and then and then looked around and and they got proof that it is a common problem. It's a sizable problem, and um, and then went about build, building their business. I think that's that's point number one. Uh, so you've got a problem, then you've got to have a solution to solve it. A product. So you don't need a website. You don't need a marketing campaign. You need a problem or a product. And the third piece of the puzzle that you need is that you need to be able to uh, um, to close the transaction to get the money for the product. So. So here's, here's, you know, here's your business. This is how you start. Okay, it's over, oversimplifying everything, of course. When it becomes more complex, when you've got um, some customers and then you've got different acquisition channels and maybe different markets, uh, it's, it's quite important to prioritize, not to burn money. And the prioritization, as far as I'm concerned, is, uh, is based on, on, one, on one single uh, KPI or target, whatever, whatever you call parameter. Uh, it's, it's the... Uh, um, uh, LTV to CAC, so la- uh, lifetime value of a customer to customer acquisition cost, and and if it's more than three, you're doing good in that particular segment. And what you need to do is to is to identify segments with very good with a high LTV to CAC ratio, and segments with a very poor one, and then see how you manage that. So you might just uh, stop selling to certain customers, or you might say that on average I'm actually coming up to a really good. Uh, LTV to CAC, so I'm going to continue doing the same thing. So I'm sort of uh, cross subsidizing poor performance segments, uh, less profitable. But at the end of the day, I'm getting um, you know good absolute uh, absolute uh, amount of, of revenue. So I'm happy with that. But this is the critical this is the critical part, and this is how I believe everything needs to be managed. And um, it's the cocktail cocktail LTV of a, of a particular segment. Uh, LTV to CAC to a particular segment, and, and you're referring, I guess, mostly to to pay channels to to allies. This no, I mean, through through organic channels, it's also possible. But I, I would assume that it takes. I mean, if you, if you're starting out with a new strategy, I, I assume like you know the page uh, the pay channels are much faster, you know, to to build rather than than uh, organic ones, right? And also, I mean, organic is often more difficult to measure and and to segment. I guess, right? Well, organic channels also have their cost, right? So um, you you need to have you need to have someone to uh, to produce to produce content to uh, to uh, SEO optim- optimized, etc. So you might have an in-house team, or you might have an agency. There is cost associated with it. Then, if you start if you start building uh, building backlinks, so if you start putting content out, placing it uh, placing articles in uh, in respectable respectable media and sites with good authority, you have got to pay for it. So this carries this carries some cost, but um, um, 
the conversion of organic traffic into uh, into business normally is incomparable to to performance. So it's always uh, uh, it's always higher. But let us not forget one thing, which is which is really important, and that's the attribution. So how do you attribute your um, uh, your leads? Uh, believe it or not, uh, even today there are businesses who uh, do last last click attribution. But it doesn't work this way, it, it, and it never did. People need to touch touch your business, touch your product, information about your product, many different ways. So you've got to take that into account and and build uh, uh, as good as possible uh, acquisition attribution model to uh, uh, to really understand the cost of uh, of, of virus of virus channels. And, and another interesting aspect of it, I think, because many people do say that organic converts much better than paid. Um, but I think when they say that, because um, what I can see from our, our clients, because, I mean, we do organic. I mean, I think we're one of the only organic marketing platforms. We focus only on organic, either either SEO or social media organic. And what happens is, what, usually when we start working with a business, even if it's a business that, that does quite a lot of content, I can tell you that the businesses that manage to create content on a, on a large scale are very, very few. Uh, it's, it's pretty scarce, uh, pretty, pretty rare, I mean. Um, and the businesses that manage to create content and generate traffic, out of those businesses that are probably 5% of businesses, from them, I mean, I haven't seen many that can really uh, very again, very very few and far between are the businesses who manage to also convert that organic traffic. The organic traffic that they're converting is mostly branded traffic that goes to their homepage or their product pages, but it's mostly branded. And so branded traffic, of course, converts very well because people are searching for your brand. Like you say, they had previous touches with your brand. Okay, so they saw you on social media, they saw an ad, they saw a post, they heard from a friend, whatever, and then they're searching for the brand, and then. And then the conversion can be very, very high. But another interesting point here is, okay, so we say on one hand, branded traffic, so organic, when people say organic traffic that converts, usually they refer to brand eventually. So branded traffic converts really well. So the question is, how do you increase branded traffic? And that's branding. But but I think the kind of like the paradox here is that on one hand, you say, Branded traffic converts really well. I mean, in fact, I just saw um, uh, a research from from Neil Patel that he shows that most of the of the online sales. I mean, a high percentage of them. I can find it. I can I can show you this graph. Most of them are, are come from branded searches, and of course, because you know you do buy brands. I mean, you buy a Mac or an iPhone or a Samsung a Galaxy or whatever, or, or Nike shoes or Adidas, the clothes, the, the car. Uh, that you buy, it's it's all brands, and so of course most of the sales are branded uh, are branded searches. Most of the branded searches result, or a high percentage of the branded searches convert into sales. But if you tell a company, okay, so let's invest in that, let's get more branded searches to our website. In other words, let's inv- let's invest in branding, okay. And most performance marketers, which is the biggest part of online marketers are in performance, it's measurable, you don't do whatever, what you can measure, et cetera, et cetera. They don't like to invest in branding because you can't measure it. How do you measure it? So on one hand, they say uh, organic brand converts better than anything else. On the other hand, they say, no, we don't want to do branding. We can't measure it. What, what does it mean to invest in branding? Let's do PPC. We can measure, you know, we can target keywords. Let's target people on Meta, Facebook, Instagram. So how do you reconcile this? How do you, I mean? You don't. You don't. You don't. You fight the good fight. <laughs> you know, you fight the good fight. It's uh, it's impossible because, yeah, if, if you as a performance marketer, you, you set yourself a performance marketing targets, of course, you're going to be optimizing towards performance marketing targets. So this conversation is, is useless because we're talking about completely different things. So uh, um, you you need to talk to people. You, you need to you need to show them some wins uh, and some losses. Uh, you need to switch off performance 
uh, you know, if you've got the balls, but my French, to do this for, for some time and see what happens to uh, uh, to the traffic and to to the leads and to, to the conversions. And you've got to be able to work with performance marketers in, as as a one team and and and, and test and test these things. Um, uh, the like the Google Google Trends they show you active interest in your brand. You know, if you uh, if your Google Trends graph goes like that or even like that. Great. It shows you that you're, you're doing the right the right job. And if you switch off your performance um, for some time and see that the graph hasn't hasn't really uh, fallen fallen down, hasn't decreased, uh, and your traffic and the traffic the quality quality traffic hasn't hasn't decreased, then maybe uh, performance performance traffic does not play such a big part in it. So um, uh, you've got you know you you've got to talk to people. It's a uh, it's it's a difficult conversation, I know, and it's it's difficult to win this conversation. But I, uh, um, uh, I know, and I have data, and I have seen data that if you work over time consistently uh, on your content, and you move strategically from a lead generating business into demand generating business, then the quality of your leads and the cost of your leads, uh, the traffic coming coming in becomes much higher and it's, uh and, and and if you look for cases uh, uh then there are plenty of cases uh which which exist so you need a strong cmo who uh who believes in it who has the tools to to do this as a team can support support them uh in in doing this and um and a good ceo who is willing to listen and who is willing to um you know to give the cmo some time to prove to prove the concept, you're saying uh, basically you're saying demand generation versus lead generation, and and uh, I'm very very much interested in that because, yeah, like you say, um, like just doing like outreach all the time and and and, and B two B. I mean, um, SDR activities. It seems to me because I my background is, is B two C, and we built Intel as a, as a marketing platform, so we we do. Kind of like B two C marketing, even though we do it also for B two B, but it has the same principles. I kind of like, I have the belief that that B two C marketers are better because in, in B two C, it's all about marketing. You need to market to like minimum thousands, tens of thousands, or millions. I know, or you know, maybe sometimes I can't. Alibaba probably hundreds of millions of people, so you can't speak to anyone personally. You can't have an SDR team reaching out to them. You need to be you need to be a proper marketer, you know. Whereas in B two B. You can talk about it's like there's there's more ways to hide your failures rather than I mean it's not always true I know but but I, I see like things like for example B two B now they say PLG you know like product like growth you know um, and they have a term for it in in consumer it's true to everyone any every consumer product I mean not clothed right but like an app they're doing PLG all of them and they never gave it any a fancy name that's just what they do. Um, but then when I came into like, when I, we started like uh, this company, we started like selling, you know, B2B and then you start reaching out to people and you start building like this SDR activity. And it seems to me like all the time, like so uh, inefficient compared to like the funnels that I built previously in, in, in B2C, which is demand gen rather than, than lead gen. So I really wonder like, what's your approach to how to move from what most B2B businesses do, which is lead generation, you know, SDR activities into demand gen. Because I think that's really the holy grail. If you can if you can build a brand that people search for, if you can reach people in a different way so they're interested in what you have to offer, it's much more valuable than having to reach out to people every time. It's like, again, it's almost like the, the, this struggle between paint versus organic. You stop paint, it stops. Organic keeps on on working for you in in a way you know it's it doesn't stop when you when you close the phone you know well first first of all we don't kill lead gen it's it's a great it's a great tool uh, and and you get a lot of business that way but uh but we know that throughout the year out of all the customers that potentially are thinking of buying your product or maybe thinking at some time in the future you've got maybe five ten percent at any given time out of all the all the potential universe of customers so, so, so these people, a lot of these people are captured through lead generation, through, uh, through performance marketing, and that's and that's that's really good. But what about the rest ninety percent? 
And you've got to work with these 90% so that when they're ready to buy, uh, the name of your business will be up here, hopefully, you know, what they call, what they call top of mind brand, brand, brand awareness. But how do you achieve that? You achieve that by building a demand generation business. So that you communicate with them, you build content, which is useful to them. You collect their email addresses. So you give them a, a piece of uh, useful content. Maybe they leave, uh, they leave their email address. That's fantastic. Email marketing for B2B is, I think it says like, uh, what is it, like a Phoenix, or like a second revival. Now everybody's talking about it, how effective it is, which it is effective surprisingly. So, um, um, cause you can communicate with them via, via email and then, and then when the time comes to, uh, uh, for them to buy, you would be, uh, at least you would get into, you would be one of the businesses they would consider, right? Well, if there is no, uh, there is no, um, email address, uh, you can, you can still continue providing useful content. And, and so they'll be reading useful things about, uh, about different things that interest them and hopefully linking, uh, you to that solution to the problem that they have, which is what Brian Sharp is talking about all, all the time, creating mental associations with your products. You've got to create mental associations with your product, in, uh, you know, in, uh, in any situation which is uh, applicable to a particular customer pain, it's linked to, to, your, to your product. And so, and if they, uh, and it might sound like really, really basic and, uh, but you know, if people have heard about you, then if they see now um, a Google ad, there's a high chance that they would click on it, right? So what I've, what I've seen n- numerous times uh, and I've done it, I've done, done it myself, doing campaigns for the same audience, uh, a branding campaign, um, and then, uh, and then a performance, performance campaign. So branding first, and then the performance campaign, the conversion on performance is higher than on, on the, uh, on the group where they'd seen the branding campaign than, uh, than where they hadn't seen the branding campaign, but you got to run the branding campaign first. And that campaign could be whatever, you know, YouTube videos, or it could be, uh, uh, uh could be, a. Uh, block content on your uh, on your site, or it could be an article uh, which you bought Forbes if you've got you know a few thousand bucks to do it. You mean basically you target the people first with content that's that's valuable for them, that that as as, as a as a branding uh, basically as a branding technique, um, video article doesn't matter. You, you you target them first, and then afterwards you, you retarget them with a performance campaign to convert them. So like like a like like a webinar or like download um, whatever download the guide something like that and then you retarget them could be that yes this kind of instrument where you've got sort of um, not a paywall but a uh, but a but a wall to leave your email address uh, I think this is going away a little bit uh, now because people have seen um, few conversions than in the past so so here's sort of some piece of content, then you say, okay, if you want to find out more, here's, here's click there and go there and leave your email address and get it. So uh, very often you don't, you don't really get um, good conversion out of that, but uh, what works better I find is content, which you provide on your own website. Uh, and it works, it works better, uh, like blog, blog content. It works better for both ways. So first of all, it really helps uh, uh, SEO optimization search engine optimization, right? And secondly, it it helps remember the brand much better because if you read that content on uh, on um, on on your own on your own website, then the link to your product is is much stronger. And then if if you ask them, if you say, okay, if you like that article, would you like to receive more like that, and leave them the opportunity to leave their email address, so the conversion on those emails later on. Would be higher than if you've got this sort of the paywall. I forget. I forget what they call it. The um, so uh, that works. That works more more effectively because you basically you're not you know forcing people into anything. You're just saying you like it. You want more of that. Uh, you have to make an extra step so people make a bit of an extra effort because they want it, and that's different from okay. I'm going to give you my email address because because otherwise you're not going to give me anything. It's a different, uh, different kind of psychological situation. What, what do you think in terms of, of, of like 
I don't know if it's your predictions or your thoughts of the future. Like what, what techniques do, do brands need to focus? I mean, I know it's a general question because it, it really depends on the brand, but, but in fintech, um, where do you see the, the biggest ROI or where do you think the businesses should focus uh, going forward? You know, funnily enough, the kind of the traditional things of understanding who your customer is and what the, the lifetime value of the customer is and what's the customer acquisition cost for that particular segment, they never went away. So that's, it's, it's always been there and it's always going to be there. And you've got to start with that. And, and, and then you're going to attract traffic to create, to create profitable business. Now, I think, I think, uh, this year in particular, there's going to be a weird combination of being very high tech, very AI driven, very, uh, big, big data, blah, 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 etc. And you've got to show it that you're doing this so that people sort of trust that, okay, you're, you know, you know what you're talking about, but combine that with a truly authentic human, uh, human approach. So they know that there are real people behind all that, all that machinery, right? Real people, uh, re- real offices, real faces, real, real job titles. Um, real problems. Uh, and I think if you're able, able to tell a high tech story coming from real people, uh, I think that's going to be very powerful in, uh, in financial services in particular, because that, that really does create trust and, uh, and don't forget to make sure that you've got a license to, uh, to work in that market. So, um, and, and do you think, I mean, one the final question, um, which is a big one, but in terms of, of how AI is now changing the market, because everybody is now talking about AI, 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 you know, in, I mean, I saw this, uh, this funny post. I mean, there were a few about uh, Google IO, you know, when they speak about their, you know, all the new features and everything and their CEO, every second word he said was AI, like they counted, they said like maybe all the time. Um, but so, the, the question is like, you know, how to future proof your marketing strategy for, for AI. But then on the, but what you're saying is that in all, like in the midst of all this noise, businesses should focus on the fundamentals, you know, like, like really understanding where the customers are. So I, I, I mean, I'm really curious to, to hear like, what's your, your take on that? Um, from the many uh, AI tools I've seen, uh, uh, one really stood out to me as uh, a tool. Uh, it's a neural network which helps you define your go-to-market strategy, which analyzes basically all the public information, publicly available information, and then and then gives you uh, gives you a roadmap. Um, so highlights customer pains, shows what your solutions you have to solve those pains. What are the solutions of competition? Where are the wide spaces, and then how to communicate your product advantages into those wide spaces? So this was a, uh, an amazingly practical practical tool to me that I, that I've seen uh, maybe in the past in the past six months because uh, I mean LinkedIn is full of uh, posts. Uh, here is uh, ten chat GPT prompts which will change your life. Uh, no, they won't. Unless you're unless you're a good prompt engineer, and if you're a good prompt engineer, you're gonna have a really profitable year this year, and and, and next year and the year after that, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, so, uh, but um, so because go to market strategy is like really difficult and it's really costly, and to do this properly, uh, nobody has the patience for it, and especially for founder thinks that they have a great idea, a bit of research and. Talk, talk to a family, friends, and uh, let's go. Uh, but a, a, a really um, deep go-to-market strategy based on data uh, is a fantastic tool. So this is one of the things that I've seen that I've seen in the, in the past six months. I think uh, what you just said now, like the, the 10, 10 props that will change, change your life, no, they won't. I think it's, it's a very good uh, note to end with because I... I agree with that completely. I see, I see a lot of people. Um, I mean, th- these posts have a lot of views, but mostly on on TikTok and platforms like like that. I think on on LinkedIn, it's it's much less because it's like more senior people probably hang out there. Um, and I think many people know it's just like you know, kind of like the, the the crypto bubble. I mean, with all these 
with all of the AI tools out there, many of them are not going to really change your, your marketing. And there's many ways to implement AI, but um, there's also many ways to use AI without really getting results. So I, so I think looking for the best prompt and all that, that is not going to change your life. I can, I 100% agree with that. Um, okay, Oleg, I mean, it's it's been a pleasure speaking to you. I mean, there's a few other topics that maybe you can do like a follow-up talking about about uh, demand gen. That's also very interesting. And to hear your experience there. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Um, that, was, that was really good fun, Tom. Thanks very much for having me.